If you're looking at getting into CRO and you, you jumped on here to learn a little bit more about it, start, just give it a go, just give it a crack. Because as soon as you start, and as soon as you start changing a web experience and seeing the, the change to a user behavior and how you can persuade users to follow certain patterns, certain journeys and take certain actions, you'll get hooked. If you're making changes to your web experience and if your web experience is valuable, testing is absolutely imperative because it's A, it's about, yes, it's improving and getting better, but it's also about risk aversion and insurance going that if I make this change, I could drop my revenue by hundreds of thousands of dollars and you don't want to do that. So you want to test and validate that before you go forward. The more you learn about something, it gives you the more information of what to do next. If you don't have any qualitative data and you've only got quantitative data, so we're just looking at the numbers, that's still better than nothing. But it's when you put one plus one equals three, and then you're able to really come up with some fantastic insight. You need to be realistic on what the improvement is really going to be on any particular test. And it's so easy to fall into that trap of going, we're gonna run a test, and we're gonna double our conversion rate, we're gonna be pouring Gatorade over ourselves and running out the doors and think we're amazing. The reality is that it sometimes takes a few times to get that winner, but it is a, what we typically find is that these incremental improvements is really where it, um, you get that value. We're plugging AI now into chatbots on websites to help service customers, and we can service thousands and thousands of customers, and it's a phenomenon, it's great. Most people have a very general problem that can be solved by AI, great, no dramas at all but people are people, we still need to work with people and we need to still have that compassion and empathy and there's always gonna be a support and need for that. So hopefully AI enables them to be moved up and do something which is a little bit more self-fulfilling. Welcome to another episode of the CRO Wizard series by VWO Podcast. In this series, we speak to top CRO leaders in e-commerce, media, subscription, retail, banking, and other industries about CRO strategies and the positive impact they can have on your business. Before we speak to our special guest for this episode, here's a quick summary of who we are and what we do. VWO is a leading experience optimization platform. Using our latest product, VWO Insights, you can analyze user journeys and identify conversion roadblocks on your website and mobile app. So without any further delay, let's jump right into the conversation. We have Matthew Pesimenti today with us as our special guest. Matthew is the founder and director of Conversion Kings, a dedicated CRO agency that has been transforming online business for over a decade now. With more than 10 plus years of experience leading Conversion Kings, Matthew has worked with several brands across Brisbane, Sydney, Melbourne, and even Singapore, helping them unlock their full potential through meticulous data analysis and innovative optimization strategies. Before establishing Conversion Kings, Matthew owned the skills in various roles, including his tenure at Hitworks, wherein he focused on operations, logistics, and online marketing strategy. Matthew not only loves conversion optimization, but also enjoys educating others. He has written insightful articles for top industry publications like Internet, Retailing, and BNT. Welcome, Matthew, to the CRO Wizards podcast by VWO. Hi, Janelle. Thank you so much for having me on the call. Looking forward to it. So how are you doing? Oh, look, I'm doing great. It's um, it's really cold, really cold here in Brisbane, Australia, where I'm currently situated. But um, maybe I'm a little bit a uh, little bit sensitive of the colds. Around about 15 degrees here, which for us in Brisbane is is pretty cold. It's pretty cold, correct. Yeah. So take us through a typical day in the life of a CRO professional. Wow. Okay. Yeah. What do we do on a typical day? Um, a lot of our work really just follow the normal progression of running a test. So first things we look at is uh, customer research, understanding the different customers we might be working on. So I may work with our customer research team doing any sort of uh, research projects. We call them DX audits where we understand customer profiles. From there, I may even jump over and start working with the data team, which understands exactly how those particular users are traversing through a web experience or through an app. And then um, from there, I'll work with my entire strategy team where we'll come up with different issues and hypotheses around what could be causing said, said behavior. And once we've been able to create a, uh, a plausible way forward, 
I'll then end up working with my design teams and the development teams to actually produce the test or the, the relevant experience. And then off we go to the races. We're up and running, making them live, seeing how they're operating and then reporting back the results with recommendations back to the client. So a lot of our days, well, my, my days, I guess, is really um, seeing that throughput of um, testing processes going from a potential challenge all the way through to a recommended solution. That sounds interesting. It's like uh, you're seeing through the life of a CR specialist, like how the day goes. And I think majority of time you would be spending in analyzing and then ideating with your team in order to serve the best. Yeah, well, well, that that's the way it should go. Uh, um, it doesn't always go that way. Like when we always come up with some really interesting insights is typically where it um, goes a little bit different. One of the big things that you just can never un, um, predict is, you know, what's going to happen at the end of a test. And that may give you some really rich insights where you want to deep dive even further. Or the other side is you've really got to think about, gee, that was an unusual outcome. And the, the, the skill in the profession is, is really removing your own personal bias between what happens in that test and being able to be a little bit removed from the results to look at it objectively as well. Got it. And it should be like fingers crossed, like till we see the final winner or like till we wait for the results to come in. Well, you know, the interesting part to it is that CRO over the last 10 or 11 years has completely humbled me. And before, you know, people would be going, what do you think is going to win? And you'd stand up with all confidence and bravado and go, look, this one's going to win for sure. Look, using best practice. We've seen it a million times before. This customer, the exact issue, we've solved it. But CRO optimization is such a humbling um, tactic because the data is the data. And that's really, at the end of the day, they are our feedback from the customers telling us what they like and what they don't like. And our job is to always be open and um, curious about what those results are and what they really mean. Correct. So tell us, like, Matt, you have worked with large enterprise brands. What do you think are their unique strengths and challenges when running experiments? Well, the, the first thing, the big brand, they've got big traffic, big awareness. So you're able to run a higher velocity of tests um, than others, uh, which, which gives us a lot of strength, right? Because it's not just about winning all the time, it's about learning as well. And when we're running a test, we may need to learn a little bit more to make a different experience to then come up with a, with a better winner. So these large brands really do have a little bit more traffic behind them that enables us to increase the velocity of tests as well. The other part to it is having more velocity of tests means that we can typically get to statistical significance a little bit faster as well. It also means that the impact or the change of each treatment doesn't need to be as great as well. So in these large brands, opposed to doing large scale changes, which take a lot of effort, there's a lot of risk associated to them, we can typically run high velocity, lower change, where we can get significance fast, learn and then move on and iterate. So the big brands really have an opportunity where they can use their scale to learn faster, improve faster, and yeah, typically just get better results a little bit quicker um, as well. So that's one, one of the, the great things they've got. The other part that these enterprise or, or larger brands typically have is a, a really in most cases, a, a solid base to be working from as well. And that, that, that's great. But on the flip side, enterprise brands sometimes do suffer from the legacy of, of technology. And when you're going through and optimizing uh, their site, you do need to start being a little bit considerate of how this system is put together. And sometimes it can be with just a whole bunch of um, technical sticky tape keeping a whole operation, uh, operation going. So whilst their positive is is scale and um, sophistication. Sometimes that can be a little bit uh, working against them as well. Got it. And then how do you feel that it would be for not so enterprise brands? Like, are they open to like testing much, even if they would be open to it might be like, as you mentioned, it would be the reverse in terms of like getting the results. It would be like a little bit time consuming because of the traffic volume. 
And I believe they must be like looking for larger wins because of their positioning. Well, I think it all comes down to setting expectations. And, you know, if, you, if you've got a certain size of deal of traffic going through with a said conversion rate, you need to be realistic on what the improvement is really going to be on any particular test. And it's so easy to fall into that trap of going, we're going to run a test and we're going to double our conversion rate. We're going to be pouring Gatorade over ourselves and running out the doors and think we're amazing. The reality is that it sometimes takes a few times to get that winner, but it is a, what we typically find is of these incremental improvements is really where it, um, you get that value. So um, CRO isn't this magical silver bullet that you sprinkle a little bit of CRO fairy dust over the top and instantly you, you double your conversion rate. There is a method and a, method, um, a, a process that you go through to, to get those, those results. So with the, the brands that may not have the greatest amount of traffic, sometimes that there are potential influences in the market sort of pushing some of this uh, challenging narrative out there. And we, we, we do get that a lot. A lot of them, uh, a lot of people are expecting these, these massive changes instantly. And whilst it can happen, if what's stopping a website from converting is we're able to isolate that, solve that customer's problem and, and, and fix it. But typically it does come down to the fundamentals of how you can persuade a user to convert identifying those problems, solving them, and then placing that, that different experience to see what's going to work best as well. And you just need to be mindful in a low trafficking website, the change that you present to that user needs to be great enough to have a big enough impact to help you get to statistical significance, which means it's a statistically true and trustworthy result at the end of the, the testing period. Got it. So how do you connect qualitative data to quantitative and like create a stronger hypothesis conjunction of both of that? Yeah, definitely. So the, the question, how do you, do you go from qual to quan or really quan to qual? Uh, so the way that we do it and just to, to define quantitative is more around the, the data and the metrics, those, those, that data that's coming back off the, the system and and how do we connect that to qualitative, which is typically around what the users are actually doing on the website and how they're behaving and, and the sentiment to that. So what we typically like to start with is when we um, kick off with quantitative, we're firstly needing to understand who is the actual customer we're looking at for to start with regarding quantitative, meaning that the particular persona, user, segment, or targeted area that we're needing to look at. So we need to focus on that. Then once we know that we're looking at the right person or right, right customer set, how do they traverse through their online journey? And what that data is gonna give us is a, a fallout rate between each one, of the, uh, each one of their steps through that user journey. And then you're able to step back and identify where is some of the biggest opportunities of improvement to, in, to uh, fix those fallout points that might be happening. And then once you now know, we know who, we know where, but we actually don't know why. And that's where qualitative data really helps to, to shade that other, like color in that part of the picture. And in qualitative, we're able to jump in and see similar type of tactics. Let's say session recording might be a, a qualitative tactic that we might utilize to go, Let's watch the users, these particular users at this stage of the funnel that we know they're struggling with so we can try to understand what's causing that behavior. So we use quanti uh, quantitative data to make sure we're looking at the right place and make sure we're focusing on the actual the problem. Okay. And then we use the qualitative data to then understand the why behind why it's actually happening. And that's typically how we put them together. And both of them are needed so that at least we have like stronger hypothesis. Well, you know, the, the, the more you know, the better you know. Like it's, uh, I don't know, that's terrible English, but it's um, like the, the more you learn about something, it gives you the more information of what to do next. If you don't have any qualitative data and you've only got quantitative data, so we're just looking at the numbers, that's still better than nothing. But it's when you put one plus one equals three 
and then you're able to really come up with some fantastic insights. And that's really where optimization can, can ex, uh, exceed because you're putting both of those bits of information to come up with a solid hypothesis as well. Got it. Mm. So what does your data analysis process look like? in case a test fails or after a test fails and how do you get about improving the same test and how do you consume those results yeah that's a good question because um but to answer it though just to be a little bit clear now when you say um test fails what do you mean by fails it means that it didn't achieve the results wherein we were expecting or we can also say that variant didn't perform better than control and here the reverse happened like control performed better than variant so it just defeated our hypothesis was it just, mm. so one of the things we love to look at there is was the test significant so if the test was significant and the variation being the treatment was negative and the control won whilst we the variation didn't win, we learnt something. We would have learnt why did that variation not perform as it should have, which will then give us more information of how we could better, we could create a more relevant and engaging experience for the users going forward. So it's not so much about challenging the data if it's negative. It's about being curious about the data, why it was negative, and what could we do um, going forward to improve it. However, if the test is insignificant, inconclusive, sorry, meaning that it was neither positive nor negative, that's what we would call a failed test. And that's typically because we've either A, not focused on the right people, you're not identifying the true area that you need to be focusing on, or you've created a treatment that actually isn't solving the problem that they've got at the moment. So um, a test that, that where control one over the variation isn't super bad it's where um tests are insignificant uh is is typically the the, the challenge that you might find got it insignificant or inconclusive i should say yeah. got it and how do you drive the situation over there because in our experience it turns like even customers would be like very much curious and if it turns out to be the other side like let's just take an example it turns to be insignificant how do you handle the customer reactions? Forgetting about the procedure, like how do you take them forward? Well, firstly, it needs to be about accountability and it's about why did it happen? And we need to really be, if I just sort of change gears a little bit, I think the one thing in optimization and when you talk to people in optimization, we're all kind of cut from a very similar cloth here, but I, I feel that we, we remove a lot of our personal ego in what we do. So we're not trying to push our own personal agenda and we're not taking offense or uh, taking it uh, personal if something doesn't, doesn't work. It's more about understanding why it happened and what we could do to, to make it um, work better. If a test is inconclusive and it hasn't actually given us a result, a, posit a, a true positive result or a true negative result, we need to then review exactly why we started the test. Did we overlook something? Did we not, do we, do we know something now that we didn't know before? And then how could we, we move forward uh, with it as well? One of, the, one of the interesting things that I've seen in my experience where most people trip up is where they overestimate what the MDI should be when they're looking at setting up the test. And what we talk about uh, MDI's uh, minimal detectable impact okay. is what we're looking at. And um, it's really interesting when you're, um, you're calculating how long you should run a test for, you need to obviously input how big of a change you think you're going to create through that test. And a lot of times people overestimate that level of impact that's going to happen and what i suggest and i recommend to everybody is have a look at your previous tests have a look at your previous tests that were significant and see what was the size of the lift that typically came from those significant tests take that average and apply that to your your test going forward and that will then start to give you a bit more um, a realistic expectation of A, how long you should run this test for and whether or not it will actually get to significant at the end of the day. 
that's an interesting way how you like portray and even it's more convincing than that of like saying that personally it didn't work and this and that i think this is more of a data driven approach of even presenting that how it didn't work and why it didn't work yeah it's it's all about the why i mean i know simon sitting says start with the why we also end with the why which is why was that and you know what should we do next so it's uh yeah, it, it, it's fascinating but again you need to be able to remove your personal bias out of that experience otherwise you're just going to be trying to validate your own position and you're not doing yourself or the website any any benefit um because it's all about the truth yeah, that's what you need to find got it so how do you balance data driven decisions with creative strategies in your crr efforts yeah well look it's um how do we balance data and design are you talking about oh just trying to understand in the context of balance are you talking about creative balance as in like creative balance yes hmm well you know like some some people think that to be creative we need to have freedom and with freedom we can be super creative however i feel in my experience and what i've seen is that by having um guardrails by having limitations that's where true creativity comes out and even think about the definition of strategy like the definition of strategy is how do i go from where i am to where i want to be in an environment of uncertainty with limitation to time money and resources limitation we can do anything if we had unlimited time unlimited resources but none of us do and that's where the creativity comes into it is how might we solve this problem with all these great things that we've got to manage as well and that's where we come up with a creative solution to support uh what we need to do as well and do you follow any framework and um, in like managing this out yeah and you know what's so crazy so many people don't you know like we go what's your framework what's your methodology of how you're doing that and uh it it it's, it's uh, interesting that sometimes we don't hear that come come back with with ourselves uh and the way that we typically work we've got a number of different frameworks so from creating strategy we use a softack methodology that was developed by pr smith back in the late 80s early 90s it's sensational it's used by most of the majors as a round as a framework of how to actually build and manage a strategy so softack um is fantastic um if you want to learn more about it and you know i don't have any sort of uh, financial connections but i would absolutely recommend smart insights these guys are the smartest um i just can't rate their quality of um information i also i i check out smart insights and look for 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 softstack on that one when it comes to optimization framework oh sorry just move the camera um when it comes to optimization framework uh we would use the mclabs heuristic So what the McLabs heuristic is and that was um developed by Flint McLaughlin um out of Texas America and what Flint has created is a heuristic that looks at conversion which is what we're trying to do and it looks at the motivation of the customer the value that we give what's the incentive for them to take an action how much friction is involved in the decision and is there any anxieties that we need to overcome as well so we use Sostack for strategy and we use the McLabs heuri- conversion heuristic as a way of understanding conversions as well. We've got a plethora of other ones, but I think they're the, the they're the two that I would absolutely recommend you look into. Um and if you want any more training on them as well, and again, we're not 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 associated, but they're just awesome. Um check out um the McLabs Institute. It's uh, run by a gentleman named Flint. He's been doing this really longer than I am old. He's uh he's definitely the grandfather of uh CRO when it comes to understanding the science behind it. I think that's super helpful like it will just help all of us follow those who have already conquered and have been into the industry. Hmm. So tell us like is it important for brands to test more and faster to stay competitive? And what are common challenges that brands often face while pursuing this objective like to be fast and to do more? Yeah, well, I mean, look to answer that question, let's look at both ends of the spectrum. Like, let's not test and let's just implement. 
or let's just go really quick and let's just, ah, oh, it's too hard. Let's just rebuild the, the site and let's just launch it. And you know, I'm not sure who's on the call, but if you've ever been in this experience, it doesn't always go by the playbook. And so often we have clients come to us and go, hey, we've just on the back of a, a one, nearly even a two year rebrand, relaunch of the website and guess what? It is tanking. It's going So um, it's, testing is important if you're making changes to your web experience and if your web experience is valuable, testing is absolutely imperative because it's, A, it's about, yes, it's improving and getting better, but it's also about risk aversion and insurance going that if I make this change, I could drop my revenue by hundreds of thousands of dollars and you don't want to do that. So you'd want to test and validate that before you go forward. So you've got testing and optimizing to improve your performance and you've got testing and validating to make sure that the decisions you make are actually going to be stepping you towards your goal, which is quite fascinating when we think about personalization. And a lot of the times people are trumping into personalization, just personalizing all these experiences without testing them first. They don't and even the, understand the audience that they have, like whom to personalize for. Even that is more important. Uh, look, yes, it's definitely about understanding the audiences. But as we know in testing, we can hypothesize, hypothesize which is really hard to say with the lisp, is um, of the best way to go forward and best way to personalize. But it doesn't always work out that way. That's why it's super helpful to actually run an A-B test of that experience before you personalize it. Cause you don't want to personalize a bad experience. That would be not good. Yes. Mm. And it's also like, how do we take that forward? Like you mentioned that it should be an EB test first and then personalization, because that's, that's where we should start with. Otherwise it will just be like, without an AB test in place, you jump to personalization, then it will just like turn things around and like, it will be totally out of blue at least from learning standpoint. Yeah. Yeah. So based on your experience, what are some capabilities apart from experimentation, like that brand should leverage in order to scale their optimization game? Well, I think it comes down to the, the understanding that the customer is, is really king in this situation. No product is important. Absolutely. But without any customers who are to buy the products, you know, it's not going to be helpful. And if we've got a big company and we're not all looking at the same customer, we don't all have the same goal in mind around what we're trying to achieve, it's going to be very, very difficult. So if there was one skill or one behavior that I would hope for with a, with a brand that I'm working with, it's actually through business alignment. Are they all on board with who they're serving how they want to serve them and where you want to take them to. And if you don't have alignment at the head of the business, that's going to filter down into all other areas of the company. But if you do have misalignment, what can you do is also the other piece, because you may also walk into other companies and you've got different departments, literally on different P P&Ls fighting against each other to get themselves to the top as well. So it's, it is a challenging piece, but I find that once you have a common goal, you've got a clear strategy, you've got a clear direction that can help everybody walk towards the same area and get better results. And if there was one thing that I see successful businesses doing more so than non-successful businesses, it's about that, that leadership at the top of the company guiding and allowing people to find a better way to give them the space and the comfortability to fail if something doesn't go, doesn't go right, but at least letting them know where we're going and how we're hopefully going to be able to get there. All right. So it's also about like having a common goal and then like moving forward and chasing all of us on the team should be moving towards that goal rather yeah, than I mean them having a different goal to work with. Well, yeah, I mean, imagine if you're, we're all in a boat, like you and me, we're, we're wanting to, in a boat and we want to you know, row across the river. If I'm rowing this way and you're rowing that way, 
we're just going to keep going around in circles. Yeah, we, we feel like we're doing a lot because we're getting tired, but we're actually getting nowhere. Or we might feel we might be getting somewhere, but not as fast as we're all just rowing in the same same direction. That's the best example to imagine that how it can work or how it would not work. Yeah, yeah. So I noticed your LinkedIn profile that mm -hmm. you were involved in building a community on conversion optimization and you're still. Mm -hmm. So could you share some initiatives and steps that you have taken and the vision behind this? Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much for the question. And look, community for us is, is everything. We love to be around like-minded CROers and uh, how are we building it? And the way that we're building it is by education is by sharing what we know with, with, with people because yes, people can learn from me, but oh, I can learn from them and together we can learn something new and exciting and how can we, we implement that. So for, for me in building a community, it's actually been relatively easy because all you simply need to, what we've done is just share what we know and then people are being attracted to it. And the great thing with people that are, that are in CRO, we're generally a curious bunch. So when we learn something, we love to think about it and challenge it, think can we improve it, can we optimize it, and can we make it better and make it our own. So, typic so by just sharing information, sharing what we know and help it, giving people a space to do that has helped us build that, that community and, and uh, put us in the minds of, of, of people looking to do CRO if they need help or support. Typically, we become one of the first points of call for them to, to reach out to. Was it your dream that came true or were you like curious for building a community and like, how did you ended up like making one? Look, it was about, um, it's, it's fun doing fun things, but it's so much fun. It's more fun doing it with other people. And it's also just an opportunity to do some really cool things, you know, like it's uh, one event we, we threw, we actually, in Australia here, we're a little bit behind uh, like the US when it comes to time zones or in a different time zone. And there's a lot of great content that comes out in the US at odd times for us here in Australia. Uh, so one of the things we did was throw a pajama party where we had everyone turn up in their pajamas overnight we have bean bags and projectors and we obviously were able to listen to this really awesome CRO content coming through live whilst we're building this little community of CROers here in Brisbane Australia uh, and it was great it was a great way to connect up with uh, you know our fellow peers and interestingly that that event was oh, nearly nine years ago now and one of those people in those events actually is, is now one of our competitors, which is awesome that, you know, such a small world has come in, we've inspired people and now they've built out and they're, you know, obviously going on their own journey, which is great. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's a really good feeling to think that, you know, you help people start them on a journey and then, you know, you look to your side and hey, there they are, it's great. So that was an interesting pajama party then. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Great. So what are some common mistakes companies make in their CRO strategies? Number one would be getting, well, firstly, not knowing what a conversion is would be a hard one. And you go, oh, that's, that's interesting. Uh, so what, what is a conversion? So people try to look at the website as a whole. My conversion rate for my website is X percentage. And that means nothing because your conversion rate overall, it, it needs to take into consideration what about people that are in the research phase that have got no interest in converting. They're just there for information. What about people who are actually in the buy flow? Well, they're the ones you really want to convert uh, as well. So. Um, Desktop device is different to a mobile experience, you know, different type of customer set. What about your different regions, your different types of products? So I think the first challenge that people make or problem they make is they try to think of um, just a single conversion rate and they think that it's just for everybody. But it's a matter of a conversion is trying to get that user to take the action you want them to take. And saying just all users 
is typically a little bit, um, need a little bit more work on that before we can get to that actual relevant, relevant group. That's number one. Number two is actually choosing the wrong data metric to, to quantify a conversion. Data metric, what are you talking about? So we all hear about sessions versus users. And without starting a uh, full-on internet argy-bargy conversation about it, they're very different ways of looking at uh, reporting. So session is obviously the time people are actually visiting the application or a user, number one, might go multiple times. So are we defining a conversion by sessions, the number of visits by transactions, if that's what you're looking for, or users, one user to one transaction. So the second issue that I typically find is people have the wrong or maybe have not thought through how they're actually reporting on conversions because that changes uh, a lot of, of the results but also how you're um, interpreting what to do next as well. Like so analyze is also important like what and how otherwise it's like you have a lot of data and like we don't know what are we pulling out and then we say we have data but we don't know what to do from it. Yeah, yeah I think it's it's really important to look at data the right way because you can look at data the wrong way and then get completely the wrong thought and go down the wrong rabbit hole as well. So you've got to, it's got to be right. It's got to be right. So that, that would be the, the two big ones because if, if you start, start with the foundation incorrect, it's going to be a bit bit challenging. The other challenges I, I sometimes find is that people uh, underestimate the difference between running a test and running a CRO program. Running an, a single A-B test is, you know, really not that hard. But running a cohesive program that achieves a strategic outcome and a sizable lift to a program takes coordination and there's a lot of different things to be mindful of and, and actually one of the interviews with Elon Musk they asked him about what was so hard about building a um, uh, an EV company and he said actually it's not hard to build electric vehicles or build an electric company what's hard is scaling it and same we with optimization running a one test is not that hard running hundreds of tests cohesively to make sure you get to an end goal, that can be a bit challenging. Elon Musk, uh, it, it just reminds me that this meme, and uh, there are memes as well around it, and like people are also taking this as a learning for CRO to reflect that this is how CRO works, I think. Even it's been like a uh, like few days and people have just made like more memes from it that this is how CRO works. Please understand like what Elon Musk is also trying to say. I think yeah. it's just made like multiple rounds and cross several channels like Instagram and LinkedIn that, hey, this is what we are also trying to say. Yeah, and look, conversion optimization is, it's been around for longer than you could even imagine. And before I started Conversion Kings like 10, 11 years ago, I was over in Cambodia uh, on, a, on a bus trip. And back then we didn't really have internet wasn't that that easily accessible in those parts of where we were so I was reading books so people would come through and they'd be selling books just on the side of the road and I picked up this one book called the um, tipping point if you may have may have read it and in the tipping point they talked about Sesame Street and in Sesame Street what they know is that uh, children have a set attention span and if they're looking at a screen They've got a good attention, which means they understand what they're looking at. If they look away from the screen, they don't have good attention. They don't understand it. So what Sesame Street would do is that they would have a control group of children that they would show these little tiny excerpts of, or little skits that they're doing to, to put up on the TV. And if they didn't have over 70% attention on the screen, they would scrap it, change it, or put something else in there. So even Sesame Street was optimizing what they would put on the screen for us as children to watch by running it through a control group first. And it's, it, it, it's fascinating and, and statistical significance. Like you look at all the, 
the political polls that are all banging around at the moment as well too. And they're all changing up and down. This time this one's up, this one's down, up and down. This is teaching us all about statistical significance. And, you know, if you, if you know where to look, you'll find that optimization is absolutely everywhere you, where, everywhere you go and you, you touch, it's actually it's all there. This reminds me of COVID vaccine. Like even when it was introduced, people were like, how would it perform in control group and the other group, how people would. And that's where the optimization even started happening. And I think after that, people also understand that, hey, if this is an example, it's like, yes, we understand because this is how a treatment could be given to the ones who are in need versus the one who do not get though they are in need. So what would be the result? I think that also resonates with that the example that you have given. Yeah, and it, it all comes down to truthful data. So when you can see the truthful data, you can analyze the results and make an assumption on that. So as long as you can get the truthful data of what's happening, then we can definitely make an, a, a, an outcome to that. And I think we've even seen that in the, in the, the accessibility of helpful data, even trying to understand, even make your own personal decision on whether or not um, that's a good thing for you to do or not about getting the right information to be able to make the right decision. Um, it's, all, it's all consistent. Absolutely. So when do you, and uh, like, what do you do when your clients are like not on the same page, like about a certain idea? How do you find a common ground in order to be on the same page, like both the parties, you and your client? Yeah, it's about, we need to have the common goal. Our comp my, my goal is to make, well, I like I typically make rich people richer, but it's about how do we help you win that goal that you're trying to achieve. If they're, they're trying to convert their users, their, their prospects to customers, we identify a problem. Do we agree on the problem? Is that the same problem we're looking at? Yes, right? If not, well, we need to talk about that because when we need to understand from each other's perspective of what is that true problem. But once we've agreed on the problem, then we come up with what are the different treatments or the solutions to solve that issue. And it's about presenting what we would see as a way to solve it based on uh, the, the data, the recommendations, the best practice, the previous thousands of tests we've run before, and what the cost, their customers are telling us. They also might have a different opinion because they, they've got their fingers on the pulse in the market in a different way. We're looking at it from a different perspective based on the way the customers might see that. So sometimes in a scenario, it's a really easy one in testing. We can be able to test different variations if that's the way to go. But um, it's a matter of really understanding from each other. Do we agree on the problem? How might we solve that, that issue? Do we have are we inherently the same but just different treatments that's okay or are we completely on the different page and if that's okay so let's understand from each other learn from each other and see how we can go forward from there because the only people who are right in this situation is the customers and we can hypothesize to our where you know we're blue in the face but it's the customers who are going to tell us whether or not we're right or wrong got it so how do you see new technologies like AI and machine learning transforming the CRO landscape? And what other emerging trends do you foresee that would just shape the future of CRO? Mm. Look, it's like um, they're amplifiers. You put good information into these engines and these uh, AI tools, and you're going to get good information out really good information out. You put bad information in there, you're gonna get a lot of bad information back out as well. I think they're exciting, a bit scary, they're exciting, super helpful in the right context as well. It comes down though into, it's only gonna output as good as the input. And if we can ask the right questions to get the right outputs, it's gonna be helpful. And us as CRO experts, conversion experts, we need to be the best at asking questions in what we do to our customers' customers in the different treatments. And we can take that, um, that skill and we can apply it to these other technologies to help give us the information that we need to be able to solve issues for our clients. So I, I, I see them as oh, super exciting. I, I see them as a way of leveraging what we're doing uh, within CRO, but 
it needs to be uh, respected because, as we mentioned at the beginning, bad information in, a lot of bad information coming back out. So do you try like using it for copies or like just like analyzing your data patterns instead of uh, involving a human brain into it? So do you try to use it in that way? So like, like for copies, for ideation and for like ideation in terms of like a data driven as well? Mm. Yes, I, I guess one ex example I could use here is, have you ever done a remarkable piece of work? really good piece of work and it takes you longer to think about how am I going to present that piece of work it takes you longer to think of how you're going to present it and do the presentation than it did the actual work that you did in the first place and that's where I, I, I see the benefit of uh, AI sometimes or the way I use it and sometimes you just like oh got a bit of a writer's block or I got a little bit of a I'm missing a little bit of inspiration here. I need another sort of guidepost. I need another little signal of where I need to then start investigating more. And that's where it sometimes helps me hurdle over some of the mental blockers I might have when solving an issue. It, again, though, coming back to that beginning is if I start asking it the wrong questions and going down the wrong path, it can get me there really, really quickly to the wrong area. So we need to be really mindful of how we, we interact with it. But I, I use it as a way of um, jumping over some of those hurdles, giving me ideation, giving me some inspiration. And I use that information with the experience, with the knowledge and with all the theory that we have to then come up with a, a good way forward. It's just another tool in our tool belt to build this beautiful building of optimization that we're, we're working on at the moment. It will be like how well we synergize human inter human brain and artificial intelligence to read somewhere faster. Yeah, I mean, you know what's interesting though? Uh, like I do a lot of recruitment as well. Like a lot of people look with, with the agency as it, as it grows and um, you get to start reading like, oh yeah, that, that, was, that was AI generated. And it's, you can start picking up the language and the, and the patterns that come through as well. So it's going to be interesting how AI and human coexist uh, so that we can actually get real information from real people and their real thoughts uh, as well. But it's going to be, yeah, it's going to be interesting what the next 24 months really holds. It's going to be great. So how do you see roll of CRO evolving in like five, 10 years from now? I think it's going to be you know when you, you go to do painting, right? And you've got like all, you've got those, like, you know those cool little places with those piece of wood where you've got all your different colors of paint? It's like that's digital marketing at the moment. You've got your template of paints and you've got all the lovely colors, the blues, the greens, the reds, the yellows, all that lovely stuff. You've got your, your PPC, your SEO, your, you know, your um, email, your display, all this crazy stuff. And we've all got these subject matter experts you know, across each one of them, which is fantastic in its own right. But as you know, it's optimization, or sorry, um, commerce isn't just about one-to-one, -one, like I'm just going to purchase from the website. It might be I'm purchasing from the web, picking up on store. I might be buying from a, a mobile, like a, uh, a device off my phone and finishing the transaction on the web or starting on mobile, ending on desktop. It's all connected. And much the same way a user journey and a web experience is, is, they're all impacted and connected. So where you've got that beautiful painter's uh, palette with all the different colors, then over time, I see those colors being mixed together. And we all end up looking brown anyway. And then at the middle of it, you've got the CRO people, which is a combination of everything. And in the middle then, you have the skills and knowledge to understand each tactic to make good decisions right in the middle. So a subject matter expert in conversion optimization by, by default is effectively a generalist in a lot of other, other, other tactics as well. So they can be that specialist of a CRO person as well. Got it. So have you had to ever unlearn something in your experimentation approach, like which you initially thought would, was correct, but then it didn't turn to be like, 
uh, one of the biggest um, challenges we have and learnings I've had is respecting 95% significance. And that is, that is probably the, the, the tricky one that I've had to unlearn because I always thought that, you know, you're getting to, you know, back in the, right in the beginning, 80, 85% looks pretty good, 90, pretty great. Let's call it a leader, let's lock it in, let's move forward. Uh, but that is not true. It's a little bit like uh, the Ricky Bobby, you know, you're either first or you're last. You're either significant or you're not. And to get to that significance, you need to be over that 95% level. So what I've had to unlearn is that leaders and laggers, meaning that you know, positive and negative indicators of tests underneath 95 are somewhat um, reliable. They're not. Um, it needs to be 95 or over. You're either significant or you're not. You're a winner or you're not. Got it. So any final thoughts or message you would like to share with our audience before we conclude? The, the biggest one, I guess, if, if you're looking at getting into CRO and you, you jumped on here to learn a little bit, a bit, bit more about it, start, just give it a go, just give it a crack. Start the first test that you can, even if it's an AA test, it's even interesting in itself. An AA test is where you, you test one variation against itself and you get very similar numbers. Just, just start, just start, because as soon as you start and as soon as you start changing a web experience and seeing the, the change to a user behavior and how you can persuade users to follow certain patterns, certain journeys and take certain actions, you'll get hooked. And as soon as you get hooked, then you'll get interested in it. You'll deep dive into it and then you'll open up this beautiful treasure chest of information. Don't get scared. Just dive straight in and just keep on, just keep on going. So my, my, my recommendation for people who haven't done CRO and just thinking about how do I get started, just have a crack, have a go. For people that are, are relatively sophisticated and, you know, pushing it to the next level, um, I guess my, my, my recommendation really would come down to um, it's just really refining your, your craft but not losing sight of our core and our core in optimization should come down to these four main metrics um, to focus on. One being velocity, how you can increase the throughput, the, the number of tests you're getting up. The quality, how many of those tests that you're running are actually hitting significance. If you're running 10 tests a month and only one are hitting significant, you you're, you're, you're may need to review what you're doing. Um, of those ones that are significant, the next thing you wanna look at is what's my lift? What's the overall lift that I'm achieving and that's important, especially if you're working for a client or a manager and they're trusting in you and they're investing in you and the team to actually bring them a positive return. Lift is also gonna be super important. And the very last one that I urge all uh, experienced optimization people to be mindful of is throughput. And how many of those successful positive tests that generated Lift gets implemented into control? How many of them get onto the actual website and start making a difference? Because if you're doing these lovely tests, they're, they're significant, they're positive, they're creating a lift and they're not getting implemented, that says a few things. It could mean that, you know, maybe you've got some problems in your uh, engineering team getting it up or are we generating tests that aren't meaningful enough to get implemented? And if that's the case, we also need to really think about making sure we're doing tests that can improve and tests that actually matter as well. That's, that's I think, a great way you have, like, helped everybody who is into whichever phase. I think there's a tip for them to learn for okay. as a concluding tip as well, that how should anybody lying in any phase, like mid-phase or the last phase, how should they take forward? All right, so now it's our time to enter our rapid fire round and I'll just put some quick questions your way and we would love mm. to hear your impromptu responses. Sure thing. If you were starting a career today in CRO, what is one thing you'd do differently? What would I do differently? When, when, when I started, I, 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 to, to my point, I literally just threw myself into it to, to have a crack at it and do it. I guess the thing that I would do differently is that 
I would spend a little bit more time understanding statistics and understanding uh, the value and how you can extract data would be what I would do differently. So having the ability to understand, change, manipulate, interpret data is so powerful. Not having that ability is like you've got your hands tied behind your back and it makes it a little, little bit trickier as well. So I think if I had my time again, I would absolutely focus heavily on um, analytics. And a newsletter that every CRO professional should follow. Hmm. You know, that's so interesting because, you know, we go through or in my emails anyway, I go through just trying to unsubscribe everything. Um, so which, which email subscription do we, do we hang out on? Um, I'm going to have to pass on that one because I actually, um, I don't, I don't, I don't, don't, don't read any, uh, subscription, uh, any, any emails. I'm sorry. I, I, w- I would, I wouldn't be truthful to, to myself, yourself or anyone listening. Um, if I was to answer that one, sorry. So do you follow any LinkedIn articles or like, do you, because you yourself are contributing. So I think then one day if you do write a newsletter, then would it be like, we should be looking for that? Uh, Well, well, I'd hope it would be engaging enough for everyone wanting to run towards it as well. You know, I mean, um, well, to to your credit, you know, VWO is actually one of the newsletters I do keep uh, in my inbox and and I do do watch and listen, listen to what comes through. I, I guess what I appreciate on those, um, those emails is, is when you share like test use cases because it helps us with inspiration and creativity and looking at things in a, in, in a different way as well. Any books that you would recommend to our listeners? We know that your background is surrounded by multiple books. <laughs> <laughs> Books I can help with, emails, maybe not, but books, absolutely. So um, I'm going to throw a few at you here, um, some a little bit topical, some maybe a little bit le- left to center. Um, but the first one I would start with is How to, the Master, How to Master the Art of Selling by Tom Hopkins. Now, probably thinking, geez, why would you want to understand a selling book um, in digital marketing? but it's all about how do you help motivate a customer? How do you understand objections? How do you, observe, how do you identify an objection before it happens? Mm-hmm. And understanding that under, fundamental psychology of users making a purchase or, or making a decision is so helpful through that book. It was written many, many, many years ago, but the fundamentals are still very, very valid as we have today. The, Next one I would read would be um, how, to, how, to, how to Win Friends and Influence People by Dale Carnegie. And another book that I, I find really helpful um, is How Great Companies Get Their Mojo Based on Maslow's Hierarchy of Needs. Long title, I know. Chip Connolly is the, um, the author of that one. Amazing, amazing. It talks about how different people need to be um, served in different ways to get what you, what you need, although they're all super, super important. Um, the tipping point, as I mentioned before, um, the e-myth, oh, e-myth will help you just nail processes so well. Um, Janelle, uh, I might have to stop because I can just keep going about the books, but um, there is, uh, there's, there's quite a bit out there. Um, yeah, so I, I might just stop now, otherwise we might have to go for another hour of my um, the titles <laughs> that I think are cool. Sure, but that's that's good like your background also reflects that you have n number of books that you can suggest like and like those books are also fruitful and like you have even implemented and you also got inspired i think the one that you Mm. yeah Yeah, tipping point is amazing yes so what's your go-to travel destination in australia oh well i actually just came back from melbourne i love melbourne apart from the weather it's rubbish so cold down there but um i love melbourne i think it is full of uh culture i I love the coffee culture down there they definitely know how to do food uh down there in melbourne but yeah i I love it i love it also all my extended family down in melbourne so i love to go hang out with family so that's that's where i like to go yeah 
one thing that AI will replace in the next three years? Well, I'd like it to replace me having to do the dishes and um, having to make my bed every morning, but I don't think it's going to do that. I think AI... Um, I, I, what AI will replace... I think AI is going to... I don't know if it will actually replace in the sense, or will it enrich? I don't know, I'm, I'm just a forever positive person, <laughs> optimistic and, and thinking that, um, uh, you know, it's, it's not going to hurt too much. But I, I guess it will enable quality individuals and helpful practitioners to do what they're doing faster and better. And of those, uh, of those roles where AI might make it a little bit more redundant um, or maybe not as helpful, maybe those people would be able to escalate into more um, helpful positions. And I'll give an example around that is customer service. And we're, you know, we're plugging AI now into chatbots on websites to help service customers. And we can service thousands and thousands of customers. And it's a phenomenon, it's great, awesome. There is also though the need to help people. And most people have a very general problem that can be solved by AI, great, no dramas at all. But people are people. We still need to work with people and we need to still have that compassion and empathy. And there's always going to be a support and need for that. And that's where we can elevate people to have a higher level of value, a lot of worth, self-value um, um, out of the work that they do by doing something that's a little bit more enriching. So hopefully AI enables them to be moved up and do something which is a little bit more self-fulfilling than what they're currently doing. Yeah, it, it shouldn't be like replacing humans and it won't. I think it would not have that capability, we, as you mentioned, that we still need human brains to utilize that effectively. Yeah, well, because if, if we stop needing human beings, then we stop. <laughs> it's an interesting, it's an interesting world. And I don't have the answer to that one, but um, I'm definitely keen to find out. <laughs> True. So tell us, like, if you were not a, or if you would not be a CRO specialist, what uh, the profession would you have chosen? I would have been a teacher. I I love I love teaching. I love sharing new knowledge. I love helping people get to an understanding, and then I, I love the fact when they can give me their interpretation of what they've learned because then I learn something too. So yeah, if I, if I if I could have been anything. Um, other than what I'm doing right now, would definitely be uh, teaching, and I, I just love um, just just seeing the the spark that happens when people learn something um, for the first time. One CRO metric that you wish people should start obsessing over: uh, site-wide conversion rate, because it doesn't mean anything. What's your conversion rate on your desktop, your mobile, your segment, your buy flow users? You know. Uh, overall site metrics, it's not super helpful. And a dream or goal you want to achieve in the next three years? Uh, I would like to start my own retail brand and utilize my optimization skills to put that onto the world stage. That's great. Yeah. So then you would not even need a CRO specialist. You yourself would be the one who would do everything. Uh, well, I'd, I'd, I'd hope so, but uh, <laughs> but we could obviously delegate it out because there's a lot of smart people in the world. There's some amazing optimization people. I've got to meet some of them and, oh, there's so much talent in the market um, that's just evolving. So, yeah, hopefully by the time we get there, I can just uh, sit back a little bit and one of my strategists can jump on and, and take the reins. Great. So, all right, this has been an engrossing exploration of Sierra Wizards. Stay tuned. Until then, happy optimizing. Thank you, Janelle. Thank you, everybody. Have a lovely day.